So welcome to Water Academy. This is our second session that we've done in the in the online distance learning world. So thanks for joining us. Um, we have an interesting day today. Uh, we've, we're going to be talking about sustainable agriculture, sustainable community agriculture. Uh, we've got Steve Blayback here from Root Down Farm. So we sent you his website. He's, he's waving at you now from his greenhouse. Um, and we're going to, we're working with uh, some equipment from Waterkeeper uh, to get some, some outside footage for you today. Um, and we also have with us today, we have Kyle Semmel and we have Rachel Krasowski from Western New York Land Conservancy. So Rachel's waving right now. Um, Kyle, do you want to wave too so people can see you? If you see somebody waving. <laughs> uh, you know what, Rachel, why don't you say something very briefly and Kyle say something so that your view will appear on the screen for a minute for folks. Sure. Um, the one thing I will say is that um, if you are interested in seeing more than just the speaker, um, there's a, a button in the upper right where you can change between gallery view and speaker view, um, which is what I have. So I can see everyone's faces who's sharing them. Um, otherwise, I'll pop up when you've got me this way. <laughs> nice. Okay. And uh, Kyle, go ahead and say hello. Yeah, hi, I'm Kyle Summer from Land Conservancy. Um, as of right now, I'm only seeing a few of you myself. I have the whole screen now, but I see a lot of just dark screens with names. So I don't see everybody. Okay, that's good. So now you know what I look like. Um, <laughs> and now I start to know what you look like. So I look forward to this, and I'm going to mute myself again. So we'll talk later. Thanks, Kyle. So, uh, so just a quick rundown before we say hello to Steve and uh, we'll see all the, all the wind treats us over here. Um, so guys, if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat and I can ask them for you. You can unmute them yourself when we have a little break here and you can ask them yourself. Um, and that's how we're gonna do questions. And yeah, just check out your settings. Like if you just make sure that you can see Steve, like if you want, um, there is a there is a setting that says pin video where you can you can hit that pin video and it will stay on Steve if you want to mostly watch Steve, uh, but it should actually go to him when <laughs> when he's speaking. So um, with the understanding that this is a little bit of an awkward venue, we're all used to speaking live. So Steve, we're bearing with you. We we get it, <laughs> um, but we're here and we can ask questions and we can chat with you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to you to tell us a little bit of the story of Root Down Farm. Very good. Uh, thank you so much, um, and welcome, cyber and through cyberspace to the farm. Um, this is uh, Root Down Farm. Uh, we started our farm in 2011, uh, so we're coming up on our 10-year anniversary, which is great. Um, uh, my wife Erin and I are the farmers on the farm. Um, we both make our living full from uh, totally from the farm, and in a given year, we generally have uh, between four and five employees. We are a community supported agriculture farm, which means that all of ours, everything that we grow is basically sold already to members of the farm. So people buy shares of the farm um, in the off season to give us the money we need to uh, buy seeds and supplies um, and pay our labor so we can grow vegetables for them. And then they come all through the growing season uh, and pick up a share of the farm uh, produce uh, and that's how we uh, market our vegetables. Instead of marketing through like a grocery store or a farm stand, um, we sell everything to members of the farm. Um, in the past few years, we've actually started selling to more restaurants as well, um, just as kind of a, another way to have income, um, which is in, in uh, the last few weeks has really changed uh, because unfortunately restaurants are struggling right now. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how we can keep those relationships working and how restaurants can change their model and how we can change our model so we can all work together and still get uh, the local community fresh vegetables. Um, so we're, we have a 300 member CSA. Um, we do a spring share, which starts at the end of April, which most of that stuff is grown in what we call high tunnels or they're kind of like greenhouses, but they're not heated artificially. They're just heated with the sun. And you can see behind me, maybe there's a lettuce and arugula and all sorts of different crops growing in these tunnels. We have about six of these tunnels that we use. That's mostly for the spring crops. 
And then we had we grow on about 15 acres um, in another field, um, a little bit away from the farmstead here. And that's where we grow all of our field crops for the summer shares. And being a CSA farm, uh, it uh, is a challenge um, because we try to grow a wide range of crops for people. So we're not just growing a few crops. We grow over 200 varieties of flowers, herbs, and vegetables, including melons. Um, so everything from potatoes and tomatoes to um, edible flowers and different herbs. And uh, so it's a challenge because we don't do any monocropping. We don't grow a lot of one crop. We grow lots and lots of different crops on a small scale, smaller scale. Um, so the biggest challenge to farmers um, that young farmers face in particular is access to land. And um, that's where we got tied in with the Western New York Land Conservancy. Um, many years ago now, we were fortunate enough to meet uh, Nancy Smith, who's the executive director of the Land Conservancy. And she put us in touch with different landowners that were looking for somebody to farm their land. So they owned land and they didn't have anybody to farm it. And we were look, we didn't, we wanted to farm, but we didn't have any land. So it was a perfect, uh, a perfect uh, marriage. And when we were looking for land, we came across the town of Clarence and the town of Clarence had a pretty unique program. Um, it still exists on some level, but uh, about 10, 15 years ago, it was a much stronger program. And it was called the Green Print Program. And basically what the Green Print Program did, it used taxpayer money to buy, either purchase the development rights or outright purchase land from people that wanted to sell it. And the whole idea being that they didn't want all of their open space in the town to be converted into um, either uh, housing developments or um, a commercial retail space. And this is a really, it was a really huge, a great program, especially for farmers because open space can either be uh, used uh, for agriculture or it can be used for recreation and just the intrinsic value of open space. So we were very fortunate to come across the, the gentleman who owns the land that we farm on and he had just participated in the program. He actually protected over 180 acres of land here, right, right in the heart of Clarence, which was under tremendous development pressure. And through his efforts and through the town's efforts and with the Land Conservancy, they were able to put a conservation easement on the land. And what that means is that um, our landlord still owns the land, but the town owns the development rights. So it can't be developed. It has to be either open space or farmland. And the Land Conservancy is the one that holds that easement and makes sure that that comes to fruition um, for forever. So right now we feel like we're just stewards of the land. We're, we, we are the farmers right now on this land and we're just taking care of it and trying to make it better for the next generation of farmers that comes along. And it's a uh, really, really rewarding work. Um, I'm trying to think of, I had some notes here. So, so I have, Steve, can I ask you a quick question? We had a couple quick questions come up already. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Am I, am I gonna wreck your train of thought here? No, 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 okay. it helps, it helps me. Because as you know, this is a little bit different than having everybody standing around me, so it helps. We're, we're virtually standing around you. That's right. <laughs> and it sounds like you have a farm dog with a squeaky toy there. Is that, is that what's going oh, on? Oh, we'll get rid of it. <laughs> we do. Um, so uh, so uh, we had a couple really specific questions and then some more general um, uh, about Root Down. Uh, so Carolyn wants to know, how do I use coffee grounds in my garden? And there is, a is there a gentle way to keep rabbits from chewing on my echinacea? So some really specific gardening <laughs> questions. Do you feel like answering some specific gardening questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I honestly, uh, coffee grounds, all of our coffee grounds just go in the compost pile and they get mixed with all the other vegetable matter that gets composted and turned and breaks down. So I don't have a specific use for just coffee grounds um, because it just gets incorporated with all the rest of our compost. Um, and as far as bunny rabbits, uh, the, the squeaky toy dogs, there's a reason why toys squeak. <laughs> and the dogs do most of the uh, rabbit uh, for us. 
But uh, yes, um, we do have a challenge with uh, uh, wildlife. Um, we've mostly learned to live with them um, because there's so much deer pressure here, groundhog pressure, um, rabbits, uh, that kind of stuff that we, we do temporary fencing and basically we, we've learned to farm alongside of those animals because as uh, specifically as it pertains to development pressure, and spe uh, the, the heavier the pressure around us, the more animals come to this property. So the, the issue becomes a little bit more every year. Right. So we are, we're always looking for strategies. Um, so uh, good luck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and another question from Mark Anthony. Uh, what restaurants do you partner with? Right. So we, because our business is 95% uh, uh, CSA, where all our customers come here to the farm, um, we don't work with a lot of restaurants. But the restaurants that we do work with are a very specific kind. And it all has to do with the chef understanding that we're committed to growing only or selling only what we grow and um it's very seasonal and we don't have great quantities of things and the, the what we have available is changing every week so we only work with restaurants where the chef is changing the menu like all the time every week uh, we don't work with chefs that just put in like a standard order um because we, that's not how we grow we grow uh, mostly for our csa and then when we have extra stuff it'll go to restaurants so the restaurants we work with are Elm Street Bakery in East Aurora, The Grange in Hamburg, uh, Siena in Williamsville, and uh, this, this little pig here in uh, Clarence. Those are the predominant ones. There's some other smaller ones, but those are the ones where the chefs really understand the way we grow, why we grow what we grow, and uh, they work with us really closely because they change the menu very often. Great. I want to open it up for just a minute. If anyone has a question they would like to ask with their own voice, um, you can unmute yourself now and ask it. And then, Steve, if there's anything else you want to add. Oh, I see Tom has a question for you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I noticed in your uh, handout that you don't use any herbicides, uh, fungicides, or pesticides. And so I want to know how you uh, maintain your crops and fields, you know, without, you know, using all those. Well, that's a, that's a great question, and it's, uh, it's a great question. So we um, are not a certified organic farm. We are a New York State Farmers Pledge Farm, which is through NOFA New York, which is Northeast Organic Farming Association. Um, it's a, a, basically a big form that you fill out explaining how you grow things, why you grow them that way, and then you take a pledge. Uh, saying that you'll, you're committed to growing by those standards. And it extends to more than just growing, how you grow. It also extends to how you uh, take care of your employees, um, all your uh, sanitary aspects of your farm and how that you make sure you're growing uh, crops to the highest standard. Um, and the reason that we're not a certified organic farm, we could be, is the reason we're not is because, again, most of our income comes from uh, customers coming right here to the farm and having direct face-to-face -face contact with us, the farmers. So if anybody ever has a question about how we grow things or why we do things a certain way, we can answer them face-to-face -face and we don't have to get certified. Um, so we don't use any of those uh, herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, um, because we believe that they are gonna end up in our bodies. They are gonna end up in our water sources, our water supply, and have negative consequences down the road. And um, it's something that my wife and I both came to uh, believe in separately many, many years ago. And uh, so we just, we only use um, compost and animal manures um, for fertility and no petrochemical fertilizers. And, um, we use a, a myriad of different techniques to make it work. Um, we do extensive cover cropping, um, and that has all different effects on your soil health, but then also on the health of the, uh, the environment and the whole system, the system as a whole. Um, so we're always looking for uh, pollinator plant, uh, plants that attract pollinators. Uh, and the healthier the environment around the farm can be, um, 
the healthier our fields and our crops are because the ecosystem is working in a more harmonious way instead of just plowing everything at once, planting one crop, spraying chemicals, and basically killing all the wildlife around, you're, you're making it, I always refer to it like growing on the surface of the moon. It's not really a living environment. So we encourage hedgerows to grow and that those you know, urban or uh, live edges of uh, the ecosystem is really where most of the habitat for animals are. We encourage birds to come on it to eat pests. Um, we do some um, introducing some like predator insects, like ladybugs, for example. They love aphids, so if we have an aphid problem, we'll introduce ladybugs. Um, we do a lot with uh, beneficial nematodes, which are microscopic organisms that live in the soil, and they can actually eradicate uh, other pest problems and disease problems. Uh, we use, on top of that kind of stuff, we also use products like floating row cover, um, not everybody's familiar with it, but it's a very lightweight um, fabric that we actually put over our crops to protect them from insects. It also keeps in the soil in the springtime. So we're always looking at new ways of doing things, always um, crop rotations, all different things, different varieties of crops and interplanting crops together um, to try to make it a more whole, wholesome ecosystem and not just a, a disturbed farmscape. Well, I applaud you for taking that kind of effort to uh, minimize the, uh, you know, chemicals introduced into the soil. So, but uh, j just as a curiosity, though, if, if you uh, were to have, say, a breakout of some kind of infestation, um, how, how do you respond to that? Sure. Um, so, when we were a smaller farm. Uh, when we started, my wife and I, well, we also had part-time jobs and we had 50 members. Just to give you an example, we were a much smaller farm. We would, believe it or not, do go through crops by hand and take pests off when we had an infestation. Wow. Um, now we've gotten to the point where um, if we do have a specific infestation of a, a, a and the, the, the bug that comes to mind is the Colorado potato beetle. Um, so specifically on, not even so much on our potato crops, but on our eggplant crops, they love mm -hmm. egg. Um, we will use, and it's a completely organic approved um, uh, pesticide, uh, it's pyrethrum based, it's a chrysanthemum based product. Um, we have sprayed that in the past in full disclosure to our, our customers. And again, it is a certified organic pesticide. Um, so it has a very uh, low residue in the soil and it breaks down very quickly um, and, and of course we follow all the guidelines for when to spray them and we're always taking every measure to make sure we don't have to do that and in, in the 10 years that we've been here we've probably only sprayed three or four times um, because of an infestation um, and we're always working on ways to make sure we have to do it even less than that so it's a good question because it is a it is a thing that is under um, realized in the food system with labeling on food that you buy at grocery stores is sometimes organic produce can actually be sprayed more than conventional produce. It's just being sprayed with uh, sprays that are organic approved. So it's kind of a, a not all organic produce is complete, completely unsprayed. Um, so it's something that is very lacking in the education of consumers um, in the grocery stores and supermarkets. That's why we think it's so important for a consumer to know their farmer and be able to ask those kind of questions so we can have a conversation like this about it. Thanks, that was very informative. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask Steve? Um, since we're in a little pause here. Um, Steve, I have a question for you. <laughs> um, we, uh, in the past, have talked about climate change. Um, do you see an impact in the years that you've been doing this work? And is that something that you need to plan for? What, what, what role does that play in your work? Right. So, uh, you know, like I said, we've been doing this for 10 years now. And I'm very fortunate that my wife, Erin, takes meticulous notes. And one of the things she takes notes on is the weather. Because the weather is the biggest challenge for farmers. The biggest challenge we face is the weather because it's 
very difficult to plan for it. There's a lot of things we can do to mitigate lots and lots of other problems, but windstorms, torrential rain, uh, wild temperature swings um, are is very, very difficult to plan for and to manage. And just in the 10 years that we've been farming in this, in this area, um, we've already noticed um, earlier springs and uh, earlier falls. So it gets warmer earlier, it gets cold sooner, but then the next year it might be the opposite. So it makes it very difficult to plan when we're gonna actually be able to get into fields, um, what our seeding dates will be so we can have vegetables for the people that we promised them to uh, because of our business system. Um, so it, it is a, a, a major problem. And I will say the biggest thing for us is the extreme weather events that we've noticed getting more intense. So, you know, instead of a nice gentle rain, uh, a couple nights a week, we'll get, you know, two inches of rain in one day and then no rain for three weeks or, you know, uh, a, a just unbelievable windstorm that causes lots of damage to our crops. Um, and, you know, we've made friends with a lot of other farmers in this area, people that have been farming for a long time. And, you know, it's cliche, it sounds cliche, but I have to believe them because I always think farmers have a really good uh, uh, understanding of the weather because their livelihood depends on it. And you'll have, uh, you know, old farmers say, why oh, we've never had wind like that before. You know, we never had wind like that before. And it's like, I believe that person because they lived there their whole life. They, they work outside, their livelihood is tied to the weather. And if they say it, it's gotta be true. So we know, we know that the climate is changing and every year we build we talk about being more climate resilient and uh, strategies that we can adopt to become more climate resilient. And um, we're always working towards that. Excellent. Steve, do you think you're going to have to change your model of interacting with people with everything going on right now? I mean, what, what are you guys doing there? Uh, you're obviously providing important food security. Um, how, how do you do that to keep yourself safe? Right. So one of the things about the term or the business model, the CSA business model, is that it's completely unregulated. It doesn't really mean anything other than community supported agriculture. And within that, any farm that practices that kind of model does things different. I always say there's as many different kinds of farms as there are farmers because everybody's land is different, everybody's business is different, everybody's brains are different. And one thing that we've really hung our hat on is giving people lots of choice. And when people go to the supermarket, they don't get handed a bag of vegetables and say, thanks for coming, go home. They get to choose what they want. And it's amazing the choice that you get when you go to a supermarket or a farmer's market. And so our CSA kind of behaves that way. So when you're a member of our farm, you can come, you come into the share room and you get to pick out vegetables and there's, there's limits and there's a volume that you get, but the idea is that you get a lot of choice. Well, unfortunately, we're already uh, trying to establish some practices where we can basically still try to give people some choice, but basically we'll be bagging things and then uh, we'll have like a no touch pickup where you can pick up your vegetables. Um, so yes, this, this situation is making us change our business model. Uh, or how we do things, I should say. Um, and it's a challenge, but I, we have great members and I'm sure, like you said, it's all about food security in two ways, knowing where your food comes from and having access to it, but then also getting uh, healthy, uh, safe food to eat um, at the end of the day. So yes, it's a, it's a challenge, and but we're ready for it because farmers are ready for challenges. That's what we do, so we'll adapt. That's great. Do you have any advice for like people who may be wanting to either young people starting careers or people who may want a career change to get into farming? Um, I uh, thoughts, you know, of of the scene right now. Uh, what 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 do you what do you see? Yeah, absolutely. So we're really lucky. Um, I should say. So my wife and I both um, attended uh, 
we went to school for different things. And before we knew each other, we, we got into farming uh, through apprenticing on farms. So we didn't grow up farmers or living on a farm. And we both came to farming later, a little bit later in life and um, learned how to farm on other people's farms and then started our own farm. And for the first few years that we owned our own farm, we had an apprenticeship program. And the last few years we have not needed one because we've had great employees that want to come back every year. So we have a really, really tight knit, um, close knit group of employees that work here. And we're really fortunate to have them. But I will say just in the last two weeks, without us um, putting any feelers out or looking for employees, we've gotten more applications to work here um, than we have in a long time. Um, I, I really think that people are using this opportunity to kind of think about what they really want to do with themselves um, uh, and what's really important. And um, I think uh, there's opportunity out there for more small farms, more uh, locally produced products, um, and the sky's the limit, really. Uh, we have a friend who, who, who runs a business um, He's not a farmer, but he's on the periphery of farming. So he, he gathers vegetables from other farms and puts box shares together. He, his business went from 100 box share uh, home delivery to 400 in one week. So he quadrupled or, yeah, quadrupled his business in one week because people want to know where their food comes from. And particularly right now, they want it delivered to their homes. So I think there is tremendous opportunity in this area with the population we have with the history, uh, the agricultural history of this area and how much space we still are left fortunate enough to have in this area for farming and uh, opportunity, the sky's the limit. And it's not just being a farmer, there's lots of um, careers and opportunity on the, on the fringes of agriculture that are untapped markets ready for people uh, that need people to, to fill those jobs um, it should be a little creative and there's lots of opportunity. Oh, that's cool. All right. Did you have a couple more things you wanted to add? And then I just want to open it up again if anyone has a question to, to add to the mix. No, I'm all open for questions because I think that's pretty much, <laughs> sure. pretty much where I got. So. Okay. Just give people a minute in case everyone has a has a question for Steve. I have a question for Steve, actually. And I, I unfortunately, I had a glitch in my Wi-Fi, so I may have missed this part. And I apologize if this is a repeat. Um, what was it, Steve, that originally got you into doing this? I mean, you were, you, you said you came to farming late in life, but why suddenly did you decide, I'm going to be a farmer? You and your wife both. Right. So I was really lucky to grow up out in the country. My parents, uh, I lived on a hundred acres. It was big woods and we had big gardens and old tractors. And so I was really fortunate the way I grew up. But as I got older, I started seeing, I grew up uh, outside Binghamton, New York. So still in New York state, other side of the state. And I started seeing sprawl happening um, as a little boy. So little, little farms that I remember as a kid growing up seeing they started becoming housing developments and stuff like that. And I was always curious about that. So when it was time for me to go to college, I went to SUNY ESF in Syracuse. Um, I studied um, urban planning because I wanted to know why people choose to live the way they do and what, what um, outside forces make people uh, live, choose to live where they live. So why do people build um, housing developments out in the country why do some people like to live in cities, that kind of thing. So my education was in uh, environmental science and also urban planning. And one of the things I learned through that process was basically farmers, unfortunately, don't always have a retirement plan. Um, they struggle, they scrape, they make a living as they're doing it. And then as when they get too old, unfortunately, the only asset they have is their land. So a lot of times that's why you see the road frontage on a lot of farms is sold off for houses because that's their retirement plan is to sell road frontage or sell their farm or, um, and so I started wondering what was it that made farming so difficult and why couldn't farmers have a retirement plan? 
And I started researching and learning about farms and how difficult it is and how there's very little margin for error. And I started to try to figure out how farming could become sustainable and make a, a sustainable living for the farmers so they could retire or at least have options as they aged. And so I started looking at farming and what was working. And I realized that a lot of agriculture, the way we do it now, doesn't really work. A lot of it's subsidized by the government. A lot of people just owe the bank a lot of money for their equipment or for their land even. And so I started looking for business models in agriculture that actually worked. And that's when I found CSA farming. Because basically what you're doing is you're, everything that you're growing, either it's animals or vegetables or whatever it is, is basically already sold. So you have a budget to work within and you can plan and it's a much, it makes so much sense for farming because it's such a difficult thing. Um, so the people that are your customers are buying into the risks of the farmer. So, so the farmer isn't taking on all the risk. Your customers are, are taking on that risk with you. And that way we can, you know, my wife and I have uh, a retirement plan and we have a, a goal, we have a 20 year plan and all this stuff. And it's because of our business model. We don't, Put out a huge bunch of money every spring and hope we can make it back in the fall. Um, I will also add that my wife did not grow up out in the country. Uh, she grew up in a subdivision and basically she came to farming um, because she wanted to eat healthier. She was uh, tired of microwaving dinner like she did when she was young and she wanted to know where good healthy produce came from and how she could grow it and that's how she came to farming. Also, I will also note, she has a marketing degree, which has become very helpful. Uh, as Can a I, business. oh, go ahead. That's, that, yeah, that is important. I, I wanted to add, just throw something in. I want to make sure that people understand the CSA model because it's really important for the discussion. So uh, what you're telling us, Steve, is that people buy a membership, which is they're members of your community supported agriculture business they buy that membership at the beginning of the year and you get that money at the beginning of the year from everyone's membership and then they get their vegetables throughout the year and you have you know, that money on the front end to do your work, right? Yes, that's correct. And one of the, one of the things about it is people might say, um, we have people that want to become members of the farm and they ask us all these questions and they, they, sometimes they're worried that they're going to give us all this money and we're not going to, either A, we're not gonna give them any vegetables or it won't be worth it. But the idea behind it is that they're buying, um, there's a lot of value in the share. So if you were to, for, for example, go to a farmer's market every weekend and buy the vegetables that we're, we're providing every week, um, you would spend much, much more money buying it in a more, in a retail environment like a farmer's market. Whereas we're mostly basically because because of the commitment to the farm and the um, security that our members give us, we're able to give people a, a lot more vegetables than they might be able to get with the same amount of money in other circumstances. So there's a lot of value built into the share. And um, you know, it's, there's also intrinsic value coming to the farm every week and getting outside and, and seeing where your food comes from and, you know, we've ha we have members that have been with us since the beginning and, you know, we've watched their kids grow up and all that kind of stuff. And, but people are very loyal because it's not just where they eat, but they also drive by and watch, see changes and see us out in the field and they've become lifelong friends. Um, so it's not just food, it's a whole, it's right in the name, community, community supported agriculture. And that's really what we're trying to build. Oh, that's great. We, so we I had, had one. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'd like to just speak as a, a member of this CSA uh, to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, my wife was a little nervous at first, thinking we would just get turnips every week or just whatever they have there you're, you're stuck with. And uh, it's absolutely nothing like that. Every week you come, uh, like Steve mentioned, you go into their uh, grow room and there's just a wide variety of vegetables. Uh, you can pick from a, a ton of different ones. Uh, there's even the option to go pick your own in the field. And uh, as Steve mentioned, it, it becomes like you look forward to it every week. Uh, 
we did a family share with some other family members and we actually were fighting about who gets to go like oh if you can't make it i'll go i'll go but uh uh, it really was a, an event every week to come out here to see uh, their production, how it's going, uh, to be able to actually walk into the fields and pick your own tomatoes and things like that. It, it's really amazing. Uh, and we did get turnips and they were awesome. Uh, so I'm a, a convert on those as well. And uh, I was actually introduced to a lot of different types of vegetables uh, that I had never heard of, never seen. And uh, Steve and everybody here was really cool where they'll even give you tips, uh, recipes, ideas for how to cook some of these vegetables that I had never even heard of before. So uh, just a, a little bit of an inside of, of, of being a member of, of a CSA. Oh, that's cool, Ron. Hey, Ron, could you leave the camera there and ask Steve to stand there because you're a little bit, he's a little bit backlit, so it's hard to see him. So I want people to see him. Can he stand where you're standing? <laughs> Can you guys switch for a sec? <laughs> I see you. We can see you better there. <laughs> um, so we just had a couple questions come on, and thank you, Ron, uh, for chiming in as a as a member. Um, and we had a couple questions, kind of about the format. Uh, Sue would like to know if you're accepting clients, she means members, for uh, summer veggies and how much it costs. And uh, you know, a couple of people were asking about that and how it works. My understanding is you have a long wait list. <laughs> um, and then we had another question, but let, go ahead with that one first. Yeah, um, I, I always say it's unfortunate. I wish we could grow vegetables for everybody that wants them from us. Um, unfortunately, we are full already. We, we, um, we've been really, hap really fortunate to be in this area. Really great response over the years. Um, there are a lot of other CSAs in the area. Um, I, and that some that I know that are still accepting uh, members. Um, and uh, I would always encourage people to try other farms, uh, you know, but we do have a wait list, which we're very fortunate for. Um, but basically we're limited. Um, vegetables are very, uh, they need very good soil uh, to be, because uh, they're heavy feeders. They, they need good soil to grow them. And we're limited how much very good soil that we have on this land. There's a lot of good soil, but vegetables need very good soil. Um, so we're limited by that. We're also limited by uh, labor and how much we want to work. It's a lot of work. So 300 is kind of where we have to cap it, um, at least for now. But there are other CSAs. I'd encourage people to go to them. Um, you can get on our wait list by emailing us and we'll put you on there and hopefully we'll get you in within a couple years. Um, uh, we do different size shares for different people. So we do like a, a small share, we call it, which we generally say is for like two adults. Um, and then like, as Ron mentioned, we do a, a, a farm share, which is our large share. We usually say that's for uh, two adults and two kids, something like that. But it all depends on how much you eat, how many vegetables. We have people that are just a couple and they, they get uh, a farm share and a small share because they eat a lot of vegetables. So um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, $360 for the small share for 20 weeks, 22 weeks, sorry, 22 weeks. And it's, uh, $545 for 22 weeks for the farm share. Um, so it, you know, it breaks down to about 18 or $19 per share for the small share per week. So, um, there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of value built into it. Well, that's interesting. It suggests that you have such a waiting list suggests that there is really a high demand and not enough vegetables and not enough uh, farmers and not enough CSAs to meet that demand. I, I tell everybody that will listen. I have friends all over the country that farm. Um, I tell them Western New York is untapped. We have a huge uh, uh, population. Um, but more than that, we have a lot of people that really care about the community. So if you tell them, if you come to farming or come to selling vegetables from that side of it, um, we found people that never cared about organic, they never cared about eating healthy, but they just wanted to support us because we were young farmers. And like I said, they've been with us and they've completely changed their lifestyle because of the farm. So, um, but a hugely untapped market. We grow, you know, I say we grow, we have about 30 acres that we till but more than half of that's in cover crop every year. So we really farm about 12 to 13 acres and we feed 300 families almost year round. We do a spring share, a summer share and a winter share. And um, there's, 
that's not much land. There's lots of land around here and it's a great life. It's a great lifestyle. Um, there's tons of opportunity. Okay. Well, that's great. We, we have a side conversation going on here just to draw attention to it that, um, that one, of our, one of our participants has been a member of the Porter Farm, Farm CSA. So I guess Porter Farm is still accepting um, members. So if people are looking for a farm, that's one, I guess. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, and then we have a question from Tom. Um, Tom was wondering if you could tell us more about the farm to table aspect with restaurants. I don't know how much you are involved in that, but if you, if you are. Right. So I would say that the restaurants that we do work with, as I mentioned earlier, are the reason we work with them is because they are um, very committed to farm to table. Um, you know, they change their menus a lot. Um, they don't have a set menu. Uh, and that's why it works for us because we basically we call the chef on uh, uh, one day of the week and he orders and we deliver to him the next day. Um, it's very, you know, it's all about fresh. It's all about what's in season right then. Um, you know, to this point, we haven't done any uh, on-farm dinners or anything like that. There's been interest. Um, it's, it's another thing to manage. <laughs> um, and like I said, all of our customers come here to the farm, so they come to the farm every week. So I'd rather that they make dinner at their house and invite me over, but that's another story. <laughs> I, I, I um, happened to, a, a couple years ago, eating at not at one of the restaurants you're, you're share with, but they, uh, I ordered a salad with all these incredible greens. And I, I don't think I ever experienced something like that. Everything in that there was such an aroma from the from the natural from the uh, uh, organic greens that it was really striking, you know, uh, compared to normal vegetables, how aromatic they were, and, and I mean it was so incredibly obvious. Um, uh, it, it seems like uh, a no-brainer to you know go that route. Uh, I, I, I'm surprised, actually. You know, the, the, there. I mean, the list is still relatively small in the number of restaurants, but I'm sure there's got to be a, a quite a great demand in that aspect from the local chefs. Yes, yes, it's growing all the time, um, and, and we do. We get we get emails from chefs from you know all over the area looking for fresh produce. Um, Again, it doesn't always line up with the way we do things, and we're limited because we're limited in, produ in production. There's another opportunity, um, but uh, it, it, it's it's great. I I, I I was talking to Ron earlier about silver linings in the clouds right now, and I think one thing that may come out of us uh, this situation that we're all in is people caring more about their local community and where food comes from and living healthier lifestyles and um, and, and that might extend to restaurants too. I, I wouldn't doubt it. I will also say, uh, I have to constantly remind myself how lucky I am that one of the perks I have is the food I eat. There's really, <laughs> I'll go back to what I said about why I got into farming is I'm a huge fan of food, almost any food. And um, being a farmer, I eat really, really well. So um, that's another plug for farming. Yeah. And just just a side question, um, more I guess more particularly uh, so, uh, with regard to restaurants, and, and you seem to have such a wide variety of uh, vegetables and fruits and stuff. Uh, uh, how do you decide on a, on a new crop that you you know you want to get into? You know, especially something that isn't uh, necessarily that well known, because you you, you come across these new type of uh, rest more, more I guess in Toronto than, than here because of all their greenhouses along the you know, shoreline. But yeah, th that's gotta be a tough decision, you know, whether to venture out into new areas. It is, and um, that's where my wife, who I always like to say, she's the real farmer. She's the one that does all the planning. She does all the deciding on the crop uh, shares and all that stuff. Um, she, takes great pride in growing things that are hard to grow. So if she is, uh, you know, in the middle of January when she's looking at seed catalogs and sees something that they claim to be hard to grow, she'll order 
a whole bunch of it and say, well, we're growing that. So, you know, we, we don't really have the climate to grow artichokes, for example, but we grow artichokes. Um, they're not the kind of artichokes that you get, the big ones, but they're northern grown local artichokes. We grow all sorts of crazy stuff that um, is hard to grow. And we have varying levels of success, but we're always trying because that's what, that's the, the fun part about farming is, is that you never, you're never good at it. There's always challenges. There's always things that you can get better at. And some of those kinds of crops that you're mentioning, that's what keeps us interested and gives us, keeps giving us different kinds of challenges to work out and um, keeps us engaged uh, even more so than we have to be sometimes. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Steve. Does anyone else have uh, another question before we move on to our next stage? Okay, so we've got a little chat going on, just so you guys know, if you want to check the chat side, if you are looking for a CSA in your area, several people just listed five or six of them. So you can go down there in the chat and check it out. I'll try to pull that off the chat and send it around, but I'm not, not sure my skills are, <laughs> are that great, so you may want to check it out now and write them down. Um, so that's good stuff. Um, Steve, are you and Ron going to move to another location while we're chatting with Kyle and Rachel um, and maybe show us a, another spot? Yeah, I mean, we could, I, I think we could walk out to the field because I, I was able to plow the other day a little bit, so. Okay. Kind of All interesting. Right, so, so we're going to talk with the, our friends from the Land Conservancy while you guys are moving around, okay? Very good. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna. I want to. I want to talk a little bit. I know Kyle, you wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the Land Conservancy's role in making farms like this happen, uh, which is really, really important. So uh, let me hand it over to you for a moment. Yeah, I think Rachel will probably talk a little bit more about that. Rachel is a farmland specialist. She's. Uh, she would be a better one to talk to. I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are, just uh, to start with that, and and a little bit about our history of the Land Conservancy. Um, so it's a non-for-profit, um, not-for-profit land trust, uh, and we do conservation work within the eight-county Western New York region. Uh, we've been around since 1991. Um, in the late 80s and early 90s, a group of people got together and they said, you know, there's a lot of land being gobbled up for urbanization, and we need to protect the land and the farms and the, and the, uh, the forests that are around Western New York. And so they started the, the Land Conservancy and it was officially a nonprofit in 1991. Um, since then, we've grown considerably and now protect more than 6,500 acres of land here in, in Western New York. Um, and that ranges from working farms to forests to meadows. Um, some of our properties that you may have heard of um, include Owens Falls, uh, which is uh, right in um, <clears throat> East Aurora, uh, Mill Road Scenic Overlook, uh, Stella Niagara Prever Preserve in Lewiston, uh, which is a fairly recent uh, protection, N Niagara Escarpment Preserve up in Lockport, uh, Kenny Glen, of course, which is where our offices are, that's in uh, the town of Wales. And the interesting thing about Kenny Glen is that we have since preserved, well, soon we'll make it official. Uh, it's not yet, but Mossy Point, we raised $1.6 million in the last two years to actually purchase the rest of that property that adjusts right next to, uh, or abuts right next to Hunters Creek Park. So now there's gonna be a massive protected land area basically from in the town of Wales all the way out to uh, Hunters Creek uh, Park. Um, so that's a, that's a really cool thing. And hopefully we'll close on that property sometime this month. Um, and then of course, uh, Root Down Farm, which you just read about is one of our uh, farms. And I think Rachel may be able to talk a little bit more about that. Um, one other thing I wanna mention is that we're also uh, working on a project in Buffalo itself. Uh, one that we have high hopes for, but one that is years in the making, and it will take a while. But the river line, uh, we announced late last year uh, the name of this project, um, but it's going to be about a 1.6 mile uh, urban nature trail and greenway 
uh, basically running from uh, around the river bend near the Testa plant up into the DLNW uh, station there. It's about 1.6 miles through the Valley neighborhood, uh, Old First Ward, and um, I always get the other one, Valley Perry. The Perry neighborhood. Perry, I'm, yeah, I'm getting those three always. Um, but it's, it's going to be essentially, if anyone is familiar with the High Line in, in Manhattan, the design, the idea will be along those lines that we're creating this space where nature can kind of reclaim uh, itself and allow pollinators and birds and things like that to actually have a place to go, and as well as humans, as people, to be able to do that as well in Buffalo. So I'm going to move it over. Um, some of the things that we do include, of course, uh, conservation easements on farms, and that's uh, Rachel's, you know, forte. Well, Rachel, before you take it over, I just want to I just want to reiterate that just the importance of land trusts um, as a model. So the land trust model, and I know you already, but I just want to make sure everyone's clear on this. The land trust model really differs from other environmental organizations and groups in that um, they try to control the the ownership of the land or the the uh, the things that happen on the land so it's that it's that level of control where you where you preserve land and you prevent bad things from happening by having either ownership control or um, some sort of easement that you're you're holding on to to those rights um, so it's a it's a really specific and really powerful model to preserve land and preserve farms um, because it, it really once once you have that thing it's set in stone so it's, it's a really great model and a, a, a powerful organization we have a couple local land trusts Western New York Land Conservancy is is our largest in Western New York so um, okay I uh, thanks thanks Robin yep and I, I'm on the board so <laughs> I'm involved with it too <laughs> so Rachel um, I, let's let's turn it over to you for a bit sure um, so as um, as Kyle indicated, um, we protect both natural land and farmland. Um, a lot of people around the nation are familiar with um, the Nature Conservancy. They usually um, are well known for creating nature preserves, um, which is something we do too, um, which just sort of COVID side note, um, if you're looking for a less traveled place to, um, to go get some fresh air, sorry, cat. <laughs> Um, to go out and get some air um, and escape your homes. Um, there are a few places that are open to the public um, where you can go for a walk. Um, you can check out our website, wnylc.org, to look for some of those places. Um, so I have been on staff at the Land Conservancy for, well, this week is my fifth anniversary. <laughs> Um, I worked as, um, as outreach director um, in Kyle's position before becoming farmland protection specialist just this last couple of months. Um, the Land Conservancy has been doing um, both natural land and farmland protection for these last almost 30 years now. Um, and the majority of the land that we've protected is through conservation easements on farmland. Um, while the natural lands, most of the time, we raise money through grants and fundraise and purchase the land and then hold it as a nature preserve with farmland properties. Um, we work with a farmer. We usually find a funding source um, to be able to pay for their development rights, put a conservation easement on the property, and then they will continue to own and operate the land as a farm um, and reap the benefits of that. So, um, what's a conservation easement? Um, I think um, Steve touched on that a bit, um, but it's a voluntary agreement between the Land Conservancy and the landowner that says, we agree that from here on forward through eternity, um, we are going to promise that this land is going to remain available for farming. It restricts certain kinds of activities on the property, like subdividing it, um, building on it, um, anything that is not in support of agriculture. Um, it keeps the land available for farming. Um, usually with a property, you have a number of rights that are associated with it. Um, you can use it, you can lease it, you can subdivide it, you can sell it. Um, and so a conservation easement 
um, removes some of those rights to protect the land. And most of the time, um, for the grants that we do for conservation easements, we work with New York State. It's a very generous um, funding stream that is available. Uh, it pays the farmers um, for almost their entire development rights. Um, the value of development rights is something that's sort of hard to quantify. Um, when you look at a piece of property that you're going to purchase, um, it's valued at full fair market value um, with all of its rights. And let's say that's a million dollars for a hundred acre parcel. And the appraiser takes a look at what the property is going to be worth after you put a conservation easement on it um, with its rights restricted. And let's say that after value is $500,000. So the difference between that maximum number and the number um, afterward is the value of the development rights. And the grants from the state and other sources um, will pay the landowner for those rights. So it helps by putting money, it sort of takes the equity out of the farmer's land and puts it in the pocket of the farmer, which helps them in some cases reinvest in their farm to be able to um, make changes to keep them going or to pay off debts. Um, in some cases, it enables them to retire um, or to help pass it to the next generation. Um, once an easement is on a piece of property, the value of that property is diminished by that amount. So that property in that example um, should, in theory, I mean, property sales are whatever people negotiate them to be, but um, theoretically, a new farmer who's coming in who maybe doesn't have a lifetime of resources to bring to the table, they should be able to purchase that farm for the remaining $50,000 or $500,000 value of the farm. So it protects the farm from development. It helps the farmer who is currently working the land um, to take some of the equity out of the land and put it in their pocket. And then it also makes the land more affordable for the next operator to come in. And I realized I just threw a whole bunch of like heavy stuff at you. Does anybody have questions about that? And while people are thinking about this, Rachel, can I just ask you, what, what is your specific uh, relationship with Root Town Farm? Do you guys have a conservation there, easement there? Can you tell us a little bit specifically about what you do with, with Steve? Yeah, so um, the Land Conservancy, as Steve mentioned, the Land Conservancy um, helped the Town of Clarence um, enact and form the Clarence Green Print Program, which um, was a, it was a bond act that the town um, put out to the voters and the town's voters voted for it and they said we want to put our tax dollars um, toward protecting open spaces including farmland and um, so the owner of the land that Steve and his wife farm had his development rights purchased um, and so there's a conservation easement on the property that Steve farms on and each year someone from the Land Conservancy goes out and monitors that easement. We do it for every property we protect to make sure that the terms of our easements are being upheld and that the, um, the farm is, um, is really being safe for, for farming. Um, maybe Steve can speak to it um, just for a moment about like is it different to farm on a land that is protected by conservation easement in terms of like what you're doing every day? Sure. Okay, guys. Uh, Thank you, Rachel. And sure. if you guys have questions about what Rachel talked about, um, we'll check in with her again after Steve talks. Um, so just, you know, stew on that a little and then you can put them in the chat or you can, uh, you can unmute yourself. And um, Steve, where are you? <laughs> oh, well, we're out in the field now. Um, actually, we should spin it around, yeah. Um, so it's about a 10 minute walk from where we just were out here uh, to the field. I don't know, it's just a big open field. I was actually, I'm always the first person in Clarence that can plow his ground because I'm up so high and uh, it's gravelly loam, a um, couple different kinds, but it drains very well. And as you can see, we're on the corner of a pretty busy intersection of uh, Shimerville Road, Road and Roll Road. And um, 
my wife Erin always says that we put farming in people's faces because we're we're always out there in the morning when people are driving to work and we're always out there when people are driving home from work. So and but we like to let people know that it takes people to grow food, specifically vegetables. Um, it doesn't happen somewhere far away. It happens all all around every all of us, and um, and we love it. And we love that we're uh, visible to people. Um, as far as what Rachel was saying, I think on a day to day basis, there's no difference farming uh, protected land versus non protected land. Um, wh where the difference comes in is how you think long term, and Part of that is financial. Like I was mentioning before, a lot of farmers use their land as a resource for their retirement. We can't do that because I guess if we ever did own this land, we don't own this land, we lease it. If we did ever loan it, uh, own it, of course, we could sell it to another farmer, but it would be for uh, an agricultural rate, so a diminished rate. Um, but that's not really the way we think. Um, so we have to think about long term about how to how we're gonna um, not use our land up. We're gonna use it and make it better for the next generation. A lot of farming nowadays is, I like to call it uh, petri dish farming. So the land basically has no life in it. All it's there to do is to hold the fertilizer and hold the plant up. But the land itself is just a blank canvas. Whereas our land is getting healthier every year. It's full of microbial life and our vegetables are healthier for it. That's great. Um, we, have a, we have another question here coming up on the chat. Um, this is one of my favorite questions. <laughs> how long do these easements last? A lifetime of the owner or a lifetime in general? How long? Forever. Oh. For, uh, there are different kinds of easements. Um, there are some that are term easements. Um, the Land Conservancy's mission is to protect this land forever. So we only use perpetual easements. So these easements stick with the land. They are there in place for sieve, for the person who farms after sieve, for the person who farms 50 farmers after sieve. It is going to be there forever. Yeah, and I think when we when we think about that, I mean that long term is just so important because as as Steve mentioned, if um, you know if, if each farmer is selling off their land for their retirement, eventually we have no farmland in our communities, and we do not have a, a breadbasket. We don't have anywhere to get our food from. So this is really critical. And what Land Conservancy is doing is, and Land Trust in general, I mean they help to make farming still possible and still viable in a place where, um, you know, like in Clarence, we've seen a lot of development. So uh, Steve, you're holding down the fort there. Do you see the development kind of taking off, um, you know, taking a lot of farming still off the table in Clarence or is it stabilizing? I know we had the green print program going on there. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, unfortunately, it has not slowed at all. Um, you know, just last summer, uh, or even just since we've been here uh, for the last seven years in this location, you know, there's three new houses built right around us. Um, there's whole subdivisions that have built since we've been here. Just across the road, you probably can't even see it. Those two houses weren't here when we started farming six years ago. And all the lots across the road are for sale for housing lots. Um, it's just a it's just a fact of life in Clarence. Um, there's a lot of development pressure, and it's going to happen. But carving out the really important land that uh, is high value for agriculture um, is a wonderful program, and we need to do it everywhere, not just in Clarence. Uh, because once you strip the topsoil off land and build a house, virtually impossible to bring it back into agriculture. You could do it. It'd be a huge expense, and uh, it's just easier not to in the first place. Sure. Okay, so we have a, uh, another question here. Do you test for what microbes are in the soil, and are certain microbes better suited to plant growth? Uh, this is kind of going to the question of your land isn't the blank canvas where everything's been killed, and it's just propping up the plant, but it's actually a living ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how into that do you get? <laughs> I, I, I have to be honest, not very. 
um, while I do have a science background and I am interested in soil testing, uh, all different kinds of microbial life, I'm interested in those things. I tend to look at farming and agriculture in general from like a holistic view. Um, if we notice a specific problem on a crop, a specific disease or a specific pest that is really causing us problems, we'll start to go down uh, the rabbit hole of trying to figure out what's causing that specific issue. Um, you know, there's things about growing different crops. Um, you know, I, you may have all know about blossom end rot on tomatoes, for example. Blossom end rot on tomatoes all has to do with water uptake and the plant's ability uh, or the plant's um, level of calcium it has. It needs the water, but it also needs the calcium to uh, access the water. Uh, so if we have a lot of blossom end rot, for example, then we'll know we have a calcium deficiency in a certain area. And then we can work to adjust, to adjust that with um, uh, different organically approved um, rock minerals or powders or uh, even just things like uh, organically approved uh, fertilizers and fish emulsion, uh, which is a fertigation. You put a, a, it's a fish product, byproduct, and it, it, you put it in the water that you're irrigating with. But so the, the long answer is, is that I don't know exactly because I like to take like a macro approach to it. So if my whole farm is healthy, all the little parts should be healthy too. But if we do have a, a very specific problem, we'll try to figure that out. Okay. Okay, we have uh, another note here, and I think we should bring up, uh, and I think this is from Vale, this is definitely from Vale, uh, who uh, says she's related to the Mimosers who are putting their land into a, a trust for the land conservancy. So just a thought, you know, for folks who are landowners, this is a way that you can permanently preserve your land through the generations and not worry what's going to happen to it two, three, four generations away from you. Um, you know, depending on your land and where you are and what is there, both agricultural and um, wilderness land, you, you can use this method to preserve your land. So uh, did, did any of you guys have any thoughts on that that you wanted to add? Um, I'm happy to talk about um, some of my, some of the conversations I've had with some of the farmers in our region. Um, for the most part, people reach out and um, and tell me that this is the land that they grew up on. They remember, you know, riding on a tractor with their grandfather or working in the barn with their dad. And um, in many cases, they are um, they're getting up there in years, and um, you know, they don't they don't really have a plan for the future. You know, there's a lot of time and energy and work that goes into keeping your farm running day to day. And um, in many cases, um, the farmers that I'm talking to, they don't. They don't have a succession plan. And this is, um, you know, I've been talking to a lot of land trusts across New York State. There's like 90 of us in New York State alone um, that work to do la land protection work just like we do. 90, um, organization, 90 organizations. 90 land trusts. So um, the farmers all across New York State and probably all across the nation, um, for the most part, they are over 60. They are um, they do not have a succession plan. They don't have, you know, a next generation who is in line to take over. Um, they don't know what the future is going to hold for their land, but they love it. Um, they recognize how important it is for feeding the community, and they know, you know, the, their family's history around the land and, you know, who they've been able to connect with, who they've been able to feed, and, um, and growing up there and making all of their memories on and around the farm and uh, the thought of, you know, them not having some plan in place to keep that land the way it is, the way they've loved it, um, it's just really scary. And by going through a land trust to put a conservation easement on your property, whether it's forest or farm, um, can really be a guarantee that there's not going to be a housing subdivision. There's not going to be a commercial development on the land that you love. Um, you know, in some cases, people are well off enough where they're able to just donate a conservation easement, which is a, a wonderful way to make that possible. Um, and um, I'm talking to a couple of people who are, they, 
it's their family's land, but they rent it to another farmer. They don't really need the money, but they don't want to see it change. So donating an easement is possible. Um, most of the farmland protection work that we do is through grants through New York State. Um, and it just, it really makes it possible to keep this land, the, you know, that is really sustaining all of us. Um, thinking forward, you know, we've talked about the impacts of climate change. Um, and, you know, we see severe weather here. You know, there have been years where there's terrible um, floods, terrible droughts. Um, and, you know, Western New York really has it quite good compared to a lot of other places around the nation. Um, protecting land here while we still have it, while we have great farm soils that don't have development on top of them, and where we have a ton of access to um, fresh water, the Great Lakes are an Im immense asset. Um, protecting land here while we can is going to be really critical for human survival as climate changes into the future. Um, I just saw a question in the chat that says, is there a difference between a land trust and a land easement? Um, so I'm just gonna field my own question if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, sure. So um, a land trust is a nonprofit organization um, also called a land conservancy. Um, so it's, that's the organization that uses conservation easements, which are the tool to protect the land. So land trust is an organization who does land protection a uh, conservation easement is the tool that we use to protect the land. And if I could weigh in here for a second, um, this tool has teeth, people. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if three generations down, someone decides to subdivide the land that has an e easement, that is a contract. It's a legal contract. And if someone violates the contract, you know, they end up in court. Um, so it's a real tool with real teeth. It's not just, you know, we're all happy and we like this and then, you know, we move on and, and someone changes it. It's, it's a very powerful tool um, and it's why it's so, so important to, to support these organizations. Um, I see we have another, we have a, another question here. I'm going to let you read that one, Rachel, because it's long and I think it's for you. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, being such a multi-agency program, how has the Town of Clarence interacted with the Land Conservancy and operations at Root Down Farm? Is the town very involved in outcomes, or does the Land Conservancy have free range to manage these lands? So um, when it comes to lands that the Land Conservancy owns as nature preserves, we are responsible for land management. When it comes to conservation easements, um, it's the owner of the land, or in Steve's case, he's the, the renter of the land, and so he has certain rights to what he's allowed to do on the land. Um, where the Land Conservancy comes in is we go out to the farms um, and nature preserves each year and monitor and make sure that there's no building that's not supposed to be there, there's not um, subdivision or some kind of activity that's happening that isn't allowed in the, in the terms of the legal agreement. Um, we talk with the town to make sure that they're apprised of what's going on if there's an issue. Um, in some cases, we will, um, if the town owns the land um, or if the town is a co-holder on an easement, after we do our monitoring visit, we'll usually send a report to the town to keep them um, informed about what's happening on the land. Um, but when it comes to conservation easements, the, they are by design allowed um, they allow the farmer to continue to farm as they normally would um, and not restrict them and prevent them from being able to be viable farm operations. We want to make it helpful, possible, easy to do, and so we don't impose a lot of um, management requirements on easement holders. Um, there are a few exceptions. Some of the older conservation easements say that if you're not farming land, you have to mow it every three years to prevent it from turning into forest. Um, that's not in the current easement, um, but little things like that exist um, sometimes. Um, but generally speaking, we don't um, try to micromanage what our farmers are doing. Okay, does anyone else, and Alex says awesome, thank you. <laughs> does anyone else have... Um, Questions for Rachel. I'm going to open it up now for Steve or Rachel or Kyle or Ron or myself. Anyone have any more questions on um, our sustainable agriculture, our community agriculture here? I actually have a question about cover crops. Uh, how do you choose? Do you use one kind or do you mix it up? 
Great. So cover cropping is a really important uh, thing that we do on the farm, not only to build soil health, but it also keeps erosion uh, from happening uh, during heavy rains or high winds or through the winter. Um, and the type of cover crop we use all has to do with what the next use of the soil is going to be. So for example, a cover crop like oats, uh, generally winter kills, so it dies in the winter time with the harsh cold. Unless you have a mild winter, then it'll survive. So generally, where I'm going to plant my spring crops, I'll use oats as a cover crop the fall before. And that way the crop is dead when I plow it in, so it breaks down more quickly so I can get planting uh, more easily. Sometimes I'll have a piece of ground that I'm not going to use maybe for the whole year. Maybe I'll spend the whole year fallow or even two years if we're lucky. That's the kind of land that I'll put into a cover crop of like rye and clover. And I'm, I'm getting more into experimenting with lots of different types of crops being all used together, which again simulates a more natural environment. Um, so on a piece of ground, I might use um, uh, forage, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, rye, clover, tillage radishes, which are uh, big radishes that you could, like daikon radishes, if anybody's familiar with daikon radishes, they're large radishes and what they do is they, um, they actually break up the soil, uh, break up compaction. Um, so they're a great cover crop, uh, but you mix all these different crops together and the beauty of like uh, clover legumes, like peas um, and uh, clo well, clover, uh, they're they're actually fixing nitrogen in the soil, so they're they're adding a, they're having a lot of beneficial uh, aspects to the soil. But that's the kind of crop that I might leave in for two years and then plow it in. So it all depends on what the next use is going to be and what I need to do to that soil. And there's a huge list of different crops that we use as cover crops. Wow, that's also, great. Uh, I noticed there's not a lot of big machinery here. Do you guys also try to cut down? And the amount of fuel usage and yes so where we're always thinking about um lots of different things our fossil fuel uh footprint on the earth um we do everything to mitigate that at the same time we're also trying to be as efficient as possible uh to grow as much food as we can with the least human input um so we do we are mechanized farm um we do have tractors um uh, we use them very strategically. We try to do minimum tillage. We can't do no-till because of our, we have a cold environment, so it'd be very difficult to warm up the soil in the spring. Um, so we do tillage. Um, we actually uh, have an electric tractor uh, that I converted from a gas tractor to an electric tractor. So we charge those batteries with solar panels, and then we can use that tractor just like it would be a gas gasoline tractor. Uh, on batteries and we're always looking at opportunities to try to do more of those kind of things. Um, Steve, how, used, long, how long can you run the electric tractor? Um, it all depends on what you're doing with it. It's a cultivating tractor. So, um, you know, we, it's a very light use tractor um, and um, you can run it for probably about an hour and a half straight of cultivating, um, which is quite a bit on a farm of our scale. And, uh, you know, if you had more of them, you could obviously do more. Uh, but you generally, I can get two hour and a half run times a day out of that tractor um, with charging it with the panels. So pretty good. Great. Okay. Does anyone else? Oh, we have a uh, another little question here. So why are the local farmers uh, at using plastic in early spring? Um, do you do this and what do you do to get crops going in faster in the spring? Yeah, that, that's exactly why you use the plastic because it's like creating a greenhouse out in your field. Um, unfortunately, the term is plastic culture, um, like agriculture, but plastic, <laughs> unfortunately, it is a labor saving, not only do you get crops earlier, but it's also a huge labor saving technique. And it's becoming more and more and more prolific. It's a huge problem in agriculture because nobody knows what to do with it once, it's, once you're done with it. Um, what you do is you're basically, there's all different ways to use plastic in agriculture. One is warming up the soil, but one is also uh, eliminating weeds. So if you put plastic down, uh, you can grow a crop in it and 
they have virtually no weeding to do. Um, it's a huge problem because of the uh, debris, the plant debris, but then also soil that's on the plastic when you pull it up. Um, anybody that's ever tried to do any recycling of that plastic runs into problems because of the organic matter, soil and plant debris, that's the residue on the plastic. Um, it's a major problem. Um, we uh, do use some plastic. We try to get multiple years out of, it, out of it if we can. We only use it for very specific crops um, that are heat loving um, because we, one of our challenges is how many growing days we have in our, in our climate at our latitude. So uh, certain crops like tomatoes, the really heat loving crops, a lot of times they need a little boost um, so we can uh, grow a, a economical crop. Um, but we try not to use plastic. Um, it's a major, major problem in agriculture. Are, are there any bioplastics you can use or does it have to be? So they're, they're, that's one of the solutions they're coming up with. Um, they're coming up with um, uh, paper-based mulches. Um, there are uh, corn-based mulches. You run into organic uh, certification problems with some of these products because they're made with either GMO corn or they might have gl different glues or uh, binding agents in them that don't break down in the soil over time. So they do make um, uh, different products that might break down in the sun or they break down, they compost in your soil, but you have to be careful what you're putting back into your soil. One of the benefits one of the benefits of the like more traditional plastic is that it's very sturdy. So it's easy to pull up. So you're not leaving plastic debris in the ground. Um, but obviously there's no perfect solution yet. Sure. Okay, we have a question here from Alex for you, Rachel. <laughs> I saw that. Um, so the question was, how do neighbors react to conservation easements and um, have they expressed any opinions one way or the other? Um, I see Steve smiling, so he might have a, um, a, a good answer for that. Um, but for the most part, what I, what I find is that um, people that move out to the country, um, it's one of two things. They either know what they're getting into and are really happy to know that there's a conservation easement on the land adjacent to their property because it means they're never gonna have neighbors there um, you know, it's not going to become a development or densely populated. They're always going to have the scenic views. Um, sometimes they're unprepared for um, the realities of agriculture, which is sometimes the smell of manure or, um, you know, tractor noises, dirt on the road, um, any sort of um, impact that might drift off of the farm's actual field. Um, and there's, there's something in place in our um, real estate transfer paperwork that says um, when somebody's buying property in an agricultural district, it notifies them, you're moving into an agricultural area and you acknowledge that this is a predominantly agricultural place. Um, I'm not sure everybody reads that, um, but it is in place to let people know, you know, you're moving into a farmer's area. Um, the one other thing that I'd like to mention is that um, there have been a lot of economic studies about farmland protection and other um, conservation. And what happens is the lands around um, properties that are conserved um, tend to have an increase in their property values. And so um, there's like a little financial boost for anybody who lives in one of those properties is their um, property will appreciate a little bit faster than some of the others. Steve, did you want to add anything based on experience? No, I was just going to add basically what you were saying about people not always understanding what it means to live next to a farm. How, how have your relationships been with your neighbors, Steve? Have you, have you had primarily a, a good success or has it been difficult? What, what's your experience? Again, again, we're very lucky. Um, we know, we, we know all, all, basically all our neighbors. And we're, we're fortunate being a vegetable farm. We don't generally have um, odors or anything coming off. Of, we don't have animals. Um, so we also grow delicious vegetables. So if there's ever a problem, we just give people vegetables and it all goes away magically. So, 
Um, but I, I will say, you know, it, it is a challenge. Sometimes people don't understand why tractors are on roads. Um, again, we're here. We're very fortunate. We don't. We rarely drive on the road, so we're lucky. Um, it's it can be an issue, though. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, Sue has asked a question. Have any developers tried to fight this because they want to build? Um, I think that's more of a general question. Does anyone want to weigh in on that one? I do. <laughs> Um, my experience has been the opposite, um, and that is sometimes neighbors say, there's a development proposal near my house, and I want it to remain open space forever. Can you come in and protect this land from development? And um, the answer that I always have to give is we only do voluntary land protection. So if the landowner is interested in protecting their land, I'm absolutely happy to talk to them about doing that and finding a way. Um, but also we do get a lot of requests for farmland protection and for natural land protection. Um, we have a ranking tool that helps us um, prioritize so that the best lands with the best soils and the best habitat um, are prioritized um, as there's limited funding to do projects like this. So um, we have to make sure that we are using our resources wisely. Um, so in most cases, by the time a development proposal is, um, is underway, usually um, the owner of that land is not interested in protecting it. It's a done deal. They're too, they're too far down the road. Um, but I'm always happy to talk to them if, they, if I think they can change their mind. I'm happy to try and convince them. Um, I have not had any developers try to stop a conservation project. Um, but I've only been at the Land Conservancy five years, so I suppose it's possible that it's happened to others. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Mm -hmm. um, there's one more point on that, and I lost my, I lost it. <laughs> All right, does anyone else have a question uh, for Steve or Rachel or Carl? Um, I guess I have a question for Steve. I noticed on the website it says they use things like drip irrigation and things like that. Is there any particular techniques he likes to incorporate in in farming it root down or things like that yeah right so we're always concerned about our water usage i know uh, rachel mentioned earlier how fortunate we are to live where we do as far as uh, fresh water is concerned um so one of the reasons we use predominantly uh drip irrigation is because you're using a lot less water uh, for the acreage and you're also applying the water where the plants need it which is at their roots and it also has the added benefit of keeping a lot of uh, plant diseases at bay because one of the problems with overhead is besides the evaporation of most of your water uh, you're getting all the, the leaves of the plants wet and that's what uh, harbors the disease and transmits disease between plants so there's there's always um, a lot of reasons why we do things um, and uh, that's why we use drip mostly drip irrigation there's some crops that lend themselves to overhead uh, uh, because it's it would be inefficient to use the drip but again the drip unfortunately is made of plastic um, we are uh, committed to reusing it over and over and over again to the point of uh, sometimes it's a little silly how many times we use it but um, uh, we try to keep it cleaner, and we have had good success with recycling um, a lot of the irrigation components because it's a thicker plastic than the, the film that they use as, as the plastic mulch. Um, so that's why we use drip. Excellent. Okay, anybody else have one final question? And then we're gonna, then we're gonna say goodbye. <laughs> I have one thing I want to add. Sure. Thank you. And, um, a lot of the land protection projects that we've talked about um, have been grant funded. Um, and, you know, it takes a lot of, um, a lot of efforts and work and expertise to um, write successful grants. Um, so we're very lucky to have a very good staff of individuals who are able to do those things. Um, but I would be totally remiss if I didn't mention the fact that we're a membership organization. And um, if you feel strongly about land protection in Western New York, um, it would be wonderful to have um, your support. Um, either financial is great, but uh, we also do, um, do work with volunteers. 
um, that help out on the land or help out in our offices when things are normal and our office is open. Um, so if you are interested at all in, um, in being more involved in the Land Conservancy, um, we have committees and um, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can be a part of um, conservation efforts right here in Western New York. Um, so uh, please feel free to reach out and contact us if you would like to be involved in any of that. Um, and the one last thing that um, I recently became aware of is American Farmland Trust is an organization like the Land Conservancy, but they also, they do um, all farmland protection and farm advocacy and workshops and all kinds of helpful stuff. Right now they have a farmer relief fund. So um, if there's a farmer out there who is unable to sell their product or unable to work as a result of this um, epidemic, 100% um, of donations that go to that farmer relief fund go directly to farmers. So if you want to um, help a farmer in need, um, that farmer relief fund is available for you to, to make a contribution toward as well. Yeah, and I want to add there too, uh, Rachel stole my thunder a little bit here on that. Um, sorry, Kyle. <laughs> sorry. Um, like she said earlier, we you can find us at WNYC, WNYLC, WNYLC.org. And this is obviously a very interesting time, but we often do events throughout the year as well. Uh, we're obviously not able to do that right now, but that's a good way also to get involved and to see the kind of things we do uh, throughout the year. Um, and there's a newsletter that's coming out soon. Uh, and if you could pick it up somewhere, if you don't get it, if you're not a member, members get it. But if, uh, if you are not a member, we will be distributing it again to the, uh, the Buffalo Library System. And if you live in anywhere near East Aurora, you can get it at the co-op. We have a magazine rack there. It's, it's, there's an article this, this issue on uh, the Bippert Farm, uh, where I think a little bit of this stuff is we talk about uh, and we see about the, the Bippert story as well and, and how they came to the Land Conservancy and how uh, the impact that's had on their farm getting, uh, getting the grant for for uh, the conservation easement on their farm. Um, but yeah, that's really all I had to say as well. Thanks, Kyle. I, I uh, just remembered one other thing that I wanted to add. When Rachel was talking, she mentioned the agricultural ranking tool. Um, so obviously, Land Conservancy gets a lot of requests for people to preserve land. Um, and they use that tool, as Rachel mentioned, um, to determine the, the best land and the, the highest value soils. And there's a, there's a whole uh, list of criteria. You guys have that. So if you're participating in this, I sent that around with your introductory packet. So you should be able to take a look at that and see, um, you know, what they have to look at. I also want to mention here that uh, from a career perspective for folks who are, you know, part of this and looking at their future careers, we have a lot of different really important jobs happening here. Um, which what Steve does right on the land um, and his wife working the land. But in addition, as Rachel mentioned, we have 90 land trusts out there who these are folks going out, looking at the land, making sure easements aren't violated, um, put, putting together farmers with money and options and you know, making, making sure this all still happens. Um, and these are positions that are in the office, they're outside, they're every kind of walk of life and every kind of skill set. So just making a pitch as, uh, you know, as far as manpower and woman power, <laughs> this, is, this is a great, uh, great career opportunity here. Um, if you're in the environmental field and you don't want to be in a lab, <laughs> this, is a, this is another great opportunity um, yeah. for, for you to work. And I, I want to add to that too, because I don't have a background in any sort of conservation or science even. I'm, I came back, you know, I'm a writer in my background. I'm in, I've been in nonprofit arts, uh, but I really appreciate land conservation and, and, and nature. And so I, I came to this job and, and so I'm, you know, there are people out here who have more background in, in the science aspects that, than I certainly do. But, I like the stories. I like I like I like hearing about Steve and the farm and 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 listening to Rachel. I mean, Rachel's a fount of information, and that's the kind of thing that I feel my job is not necessarily to to do the technical stuff, but like how do I transmit that to everyone else? Uh, and so I, there's a role for everyone. I think Robin's right when she says that. If, if you're interested in this, cool. Any other parting thoughts, friends? 
I, I had one more quick question. Um, for the clearance green print project, is, or how's the future outlook for that? Is it kind of more in a mode now of sustaining what they've already, what they've already accomplished and setting aside? Or is there more plans in the future of acquiring some more land in the town or things like that? From what I understand, um, the clearance green print program, um, as I mentioned, was funded by a bond uh, resolution. And that raised um, a nice big chunk of money. And then um, there was, I think, a second edition, so to speak, um, and that added more funding to the pot. They've protected, oh, I'm not sure of the exact number of acres, like 1,500 or more um, in the town of Clarence. And I think that that um, has basically used up all of the funding that's in that, um, that was in that bond resolution. So um, while the Land Conservancy um, isn't able to use that funding stream anymore to protect additional land in the town of Clarence at this time, um, you know, as I mentioned, I am working with individual landowners um, to do farmland protection projects. I am having a conversation with somebody in the town of Clarence, um, as well as all over Western New York right now. Um, right now, I think I have 20 plus farmers who I'm talking to. Um, and so I'm able to work with them directly, work with the state on grant applications and um, make more conservation happen. Um, working with a municipality is a really great way for us to do like a lot of work quickly in a community, um, especially when there's a, a source of funding to support it. Um, but it's not the only way to make progress. So. Um, if you have coal in your community and you want to tell them how much you care about conservation and you think they should consider it, um, you know, we're always happy to partner with communities um, to do more land protection. Um, and I've actually been asked just in the last like three months, I think there's four different communities who have asked me to participate in farmland protection planning efforts. So um, hopefully there will be more projects like the Green Print Program in place soon. That's great, Rachel. You, you, for, your uh, staff is working also with Town of Grand Island, is that correct, on a, on a big picture planning too? So that's, that's great. Yeah, we just finished um, helping them update their open space inventory um, to help them identify the areas on Grand Island where um, they have great environmental resources. Um, and then we're also doing another project with the um, Greenway Ecological Standing Committee to do specific land protection projects on Grand Island, which is really exciting. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you, Rachel, for the really important work that you're doing. Thank you, Kyle. Um, thanks for, for uh, keeping our communities green and keeping our farms running. Um, and Steve, thank you so much for having us on your site, inviting us onto your farm virtually. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you can come uh, for real soon. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll try and catch up with you next year <laughs> in person. Um, uh, but have a great growing season and uh, thanks again for having us. And thank you, Robin and Ron, for having us. Yes. Okay, thanks, guys. So we're going to end our lecture portion this right now. Um, if ECC students, if you're an ECC student, please stay with us because we're going to check in with our ECC students. Um, everybody else, have a wonderful week. We're going to be at the North Tonawanda Botanical Garden um, to see what's happening over there next week and doing some water testing and some other fun stuff, taking a peek around their greenhouses. Um, so we'll see you all next Thursday. You'll get, a, you'll get an invitation um, as we did before, probably on Monday. So look for that on Monday. Um, I am recording this session. I'm going to stop shortly, and we will have that recording available if you want to if you want to check it out again. We'll send it around just like we did last time. All right. Um, so now is the time to sign off. If you are not an ECC student, goodbye, Steve. Goodbye, other. <laughs> goodbye, Rachel. Uh, goodbye, everybody else. And we will see ECC students in a minute. So so stay with us, ECC.